I don't have anything. We do. Yeah. 
I just got discarded. Too much hair. Yeah. You, you said in the meeting I also have too much hair. Yeah. That's what he said. He said, yeah, that said me and Brother John were pretty good fellows, but we have too much hair. He said, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's a... no. Then he, that neuropathy was real rough on him, wasn't he? He just, he just got weak. Several years, uh, about five years ago, was it? I'd say about that. Yeah, didn't he? Uh, of course, he was always a thin friend of mine. And uh, he would go off and do that mission work in India. And me and Connie are pretty convinced that that kind of hastened his condition, you know, made it get a lot worse. 
No, yeah. <laughs> tonight. Thank you so much for joining us with your presence tonight to where we can study God's Word together. A couple of announcements. Last night we had talked about Papa having surgery. He is here with us this evening, so uh, it's good that he's feeling well enough to be with us. As far as Jamie goes, Jamie did have her procedure today. They drained five liters of fluid off of around her liver. 
And uh, it wound up being 10 pounds somewhat, I reckon. But after that, she said that she feels tremendous. She can breathe again. She can eat. She feels great. That's uh, glory to God and uh, glory to all of her medical staff. Just keep her in your prayers. Uh, but tonight should be a better night. We're thankful for that. Uh, that is uh, all the announcements and updates that I have. Again, if you have anything else, see me after services and we'll get it announced tomorrow night and put in the bulletin for next Sunday. Uh, we have with us for our gospel meeting this week, Brother Tim McHenry has been doing a fantastic, outstanding job. Uh, really has been laying it down, like what I was telling Brother Jason. Uh, Jason said he had to come in and, and check on one of his star pupils, and I told him, I said, well, he's doing a good job. I can't lie to you. He's doing a good job, but just don't tell him that. So just uh, keep that under wraps for me, if you would. No, he's been doing a fantastic job and really uh, has uh, encouraged us all. Last night was a tremendous lesson. If you did not get a chance to hear last night's lesson uh, about dying on the vine, again, it is posted on Facebook and it is posted to the YouTube channel as well. If you cannot find it, see me after services and I'll give you the link. Uh, but you can catch up on all of the previous gospel meeting uh, sessions and all the lessons that Brother Tim has given us. Again, Brother Tim uh, comes to us from the uh, wonderful state of Kentucky. He is the preacher for the Germany Church of Christ. He's been there for two years. Uh, his wife, Miss Connie, is with us this evening. He's been preaching since 1986. He is both a graduate of Tennessee Tech University and uh, of uh, the Tennessee Bible College. So we're thankful to have him here with us this evening. As far as families go in the audience, if you are a family with little ones, I uh, want to let you know that there is a nursery through this door right straight across the hallway. And if you need to use those facilities, there's my laptop and it has the live video stream going to it as well. So feel free to take advantage of that and be able to stay in with the lesson. We are very fortunate to have several preachers in our audience this evening. And that's the toughest part about a gospel meeting is to figure out which one's going to pray. Sometimes I think that uh, we need to uh, have it out in the parking lot to figure out, you know, the best of the best. But uh, this evening, I know that uh, last year or in the spring gospel meeting, Brother Bob did a prayer for us. Brother Charles has been here several different times. So tonight, uh, if you will... Uh, our opening prayer, I'm going to ask Brother Jason Gann from the Campaign Church of Christ to lead our opening prayer at the close of service, Brother Tim Long from the Bonner Church of Christ uh, to, to close us out this evening. Again, we're pleased to have Brother Tim McHenry to deliver the message. Tonight, Brother Mac Britton is going to be leading our singing first song, 390. number 390. I encourage you to take up a hymnal and join Mac as he leads us in song. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right, brother. I'm say we're going to start off tonight with number 390, Home of the Soul. Do the first and last of this one. <clears throat> if for the price we have
singers get home. <clears throat> Do the first and last of this one also. <clears throat> what a song of the light in the city so bright will be left in the heavens there go. Now the ransom will raise happy songs in his praise when all God sings thanksgiving in our hearts. Thanking you for the blessings of this day. Thanking you for the temporal blessings that we enjoy from day to day. The sunshine and the rain and, and the beautiful change of the seasons that we are experiencing. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the handiwork that we can look around and see and see true a true artist, having done all of this, and that artist being you. We're so thankful for your power. We're thankful for your mercy and your love and your truth and your grace. We're thankful for your son, Jesus. We're thankful that you sent him to this earth to provide unto us the perfect example that we should walk in his steps. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we would do our very best to follow his great example. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the Bible. We're thankful for the principles and precepts found therein. We're thankful for the ability to be able to study from it individually as well as collectively. And Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the, the congregation here at Trousdale thankful for Brother Allen and the good work he and his wife are doing here. We're so thankful for his ability to proclaim your word in its fullest. And we pray you would bless him with many more years to come in your service. We're thankful for the song leader who is leading these songs in such a splendid way. We pray that he would be able to continue to use this talent for many years to come as well. We're thankful for each member here, for each one of the leaders, for each one of the teachers, for each one who gathers here and who makes this place a city set upon a hill that cannot be hid. We pray your continued blessings on this church and, and help this church to continue to be the great example that she is 
unto the other congregations and unto this world. And Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this gospel meeting endeavor that is taking place. We pray that all of the lessons proclaimed will be in accordance with your will, that we would be attentive to what is said and that we would apply what is said to our lives and that we would work to grow in our Christian lives. For Heavenly Father, we, as long as we're alive, let us never stop growing. And Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for Brother Tim McHenry and Sister Connie, for their children, grandchildren, for their family. We pray that you would continue to bless Brother Tim and his work in Germany, that congregation in Kentucky. We pray that you would continue to bless him and that work there as well as the work that he does in, in preaching and teaching in various places. We're thankful for his ability and for his willingness to stand before us this evening and to proclaim unto us the wonderful words that you have provided to us. We're thankful for Brother Tim, the work he does at Tennessee Bible College. We're thankful for all the works he does. Continue to bless him. We pray for the sick, those who've been mentioned here this evening, as well as others, that you would help them as only you can, that you would comfort those who are in need of your comfort. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful unto you and grateful to you for everything, and we love you. We love you so much for all that you do for us each and every day. And help us to be good soldiers for you in everything. Help us to wear your armor. Help us to have our loins girt about with truth and to wear the breastplate of righteousness and to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and to wear the helmet of salvation, to bear the shield of faith, and to bear the sword of the Spirit, which is your word. Help us to do all that we can to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we know he walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Help us to stand against him, and help us that when our time on this earth is over, and when we stand in that great day of judgment to come, you're going to say those words that we so long to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Forgive us of our sins. We pray your will to be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to mark the song of invitation, that would be number 523. 523. Tomorrow may be too late. <clears throat> Before, before the lesson, we'll see number 138, 138. Uh, at this time, if you're willing to enable off, I ask you to please stand. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I cannot trust the sweetest framework, only lean on Jesus' name, on Christ the Son.
tonight. I noticed that in, in anticipation of all the hot air about to be emitted that the brother came up and adjusted the air conditioning. Y'all should be in good shape. I do appreciate those who are out here this evening and especially those who are visiting as I know the congregation does as well. I can say some more personal things about that uh, having uh, heard and learned from various ones who are here including those who are leading us in our prayers this evening. But in order for us to get right into the lesson and keep your attention and to be able to get in everything we need to, I believe I'll just start right on into it. If you were here with us last time, or if you were with us also on Sunday, then you realize that I've been trying to get us to focus upon the main thing, which is going to allow us to go forward in service unto God. That is, if we will keep everything from the love of God down to evangelism, that these main themes of God through the scripture will allow the church to move forward. Because there is something that I'm a little, well, I'm not just a little bit, I'm a lot bothered by. And I should have been more bothered about it in my own life, and I'm bothered about it when it comes to seeing various congregations of the Lord. You all here at Trousdale, as you know yourselves much better than I do, so you take this according to how it applies to you. Once again, the old phrase, if the shoe fits, wear it. However, I do remember, along with this point, a... A song, it's an old-timey song. When my soul is resting in the presence of the Lord, I'll be satisfied. Y'all remember that song, I'll be satisfied? Beautiful old gospel tune. Here's the thing about it. I wonder how many brethren ever took that to heart, though, because they strike me as being very satisfied right now. Right now. They're not looking to be satisfied one day. When my soul is resting, no, 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 they're satisfied right now with how things are. Status quo is good for them. They don't like it if brethren pass on and they don't get replaced in the church. They don't like it if they see their own personal family members struggling with morality or their neighbors not coming to the Lord and them not kind of rubbing off on them, having the influence they'd like to. No, 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 they, they don't like that. But at the same time, they're not moved enough to do anything about it. They're satisfied. And when I look into the word of God, when I look at the history of the church, I see that there was definitely a lack of satisfaction with the here and now. There is a lack of satisfaction with living in this life in a lackadaisical way or seeking to live life comfortably. No true progress is made with a soul until you press yourself, until you are pushed in the direction that you need to go in. Now that pushing can be by the word of God itself. It can be by somebody who is a Christian influence and using the word of God in order to make you become something that you need to be. In other words, that person that loves you and realizes you have more potential, more talents you could use for God. But there is something that needs to push us, something to motivate us. You know, if you're here tonight and you're not a member of the family of God. You don't know where you stand with God and you're not absolutely sure of your salvation. Then you say, well, he's here and he's preaching to the church. I want you to know the reason I'm preaching the lesson I am is because the Trousdale Church of Christ loves you. That's why I'm preaching it. And if any soul is here and you're not ready for the Lord, the entire gist of the lesson is to train God's people to get to where they can make you ready along with them so that we can help each other go to heaven. So it's not that you are neglected in the lesson tonight. However, the lesson tonight is geared toward the edification of the church because the previous lessons, the one on Sunday afternoon, dealing with the big six, as we said, the motivations from the love of God to evangelism, the great themes of the Bible for Christians to be actively participating in and doing, and then the lesson last night on why the church is hindered, why it's suffering, and in some cases dying on the vine. These were actually lessons just preparatory to get you ready for tonight, which is the real meat and potatoes. Tonight's the thing. Now, what do I mean by the thing? Well, tonight is an examination of the biblical methods and to say that the Bible way is the way forward. Now, there was a worksheet that was passed out somewhat among you all before. I'm not slavish to that. You'll notice I haven't even gotten into it yet. 
And it is clearly intended just as a guide for you to take with you, see how many things maybe you can remember from what I said and mark down through them. Maybe you could critique it later on as you go home with a wife or something and say, you know, a preacher never got to that point right there. You know, yeah, all of that's good and fine. But there are so many different places and a variety of scriptures from various places. It's not just like we're doing an exegetical sermon with a certain set of verses that I wanted you to have a little guide with you because tonight is somewhat of a practicum, you might say. Let's get right to it. The early church, if we are going to accomplish anything like they accomplished, surely we're going to have to do things in a similar fashion. Now, when I say a similar fashion, I know good and well that we have things that they didn't have. Automobiles, which I very much enjoy. We have means of communication that they did not have. But still, the gospel was communicated by hook or by crook, as they say, one way or another. The fact of the matter is, is that people did get where they needed to go. And for all of our increases in being able to do things speedily, we have a lot more people we need to reach. In the first century, it was estimated there was maybe, what, 200 million people living on the face of the earth. Now there's about 8 billion we need those modern means of communication. We need the speed. We need every opportunity and everything set before us that we can possibly attempt and try to do because the time is limited and there are so many people, so many souls, more than there ever has been, waiting to hear that gospel of Christ. In the first century, God knew time is of the essence and the word needs to go out. It needs to go out in this generation. It needs to go out now. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow indeed might be too late, especially for that soul which is about to pass on in some place that has not got the gospel yet. Who will get that word to them? Who is that person who is lonely even in the community among us? And nobody has really shown that they care who will get the word to them, who will make sure that they have every opportunity to obey the Lord before they go meet him at judgment. That motivation to get the word out by the hands of the apostles was something that was really working on the church as you begin to read in Acts chapter 2. Let's do a very quick rundown. In Acts chapter 2, as many of you all know, there were about 3,000 there that were added unto the Lord. So you've got a kernel of people in addition to the apostles and those that were prearranged and ready. What I mean is the apostles were already ready. You know what I mean? And then you had also the 120 and so forth. You had a, a core group of people. They were already prepared. And then you had the addition of the 3,000. Well, the number of the disciples increased quickly. So that when you get to Acts chapter 4 and you look in the first four verses, you see that the number of the apostles now, excuse me, not apostles, <laughs> the number of the disciples had gotten to about 5,000. We're really moving. But you know, it's really only just begun. Shortly after that, when you get to Acts chapter 6, and you begin reading at the very start of that chapter, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. Wow! Multiplied. If you had 5,000 and you multiply, now unless you want to get into some fancy math, which we're not about to get a hold of, and I don't think people in common language meant it that way, then you, you need to say times two at least. And it has been estimated by some who look into history and the number of Jews that lived there, you know, in that area. There was a lot of Jews lived around Jerusalem. And you had all those that initially came in for Pentecost, and many of them would have stayed, right? You got all that things going on with the start of the church, and a lot of them needed help and stuff, getting started out with God's way and word. Why, it's estimated by some the church could have grown by as much as up to 50,000. That's a lot. That's a bigger congregation than even the big mega churches that you see having television services and stuff on the networks. It was huge. Then the church was scattered under the persecution of the Jewish leadership. And the Bible says that they went everywhere, Acts chapter eight, but they took the gospel with them. They went everywhere preaching and teaching the word. Now that is an incredible model for every single one of us. The thing about it is, is that they didn't stop there and when these people were scattered out and when the apostles now began to branch out, because it does say there that they were all scattered except the apostles, but God's not satisfied. He wants the apostles themselves to begin to move, to branch out. And so one of them he was going to use to move and branch out the most was the apostle Paul. So he makes Paul an apostle and he sends him out. He becomes the apostle to the Gentiles, as the Bible says. 
How did Paul go about his business? Now, this brings you to the little sheet that I gave you just earlier. You will notice in a variety of scriptures that in Acts chapters 13 and 14, Paul went into the synagogues, and he was trying to convert the Jews. They got first crack at it. So the Jew was given the benefit of understanding the Old Testament law and the preparation for the coming of the Messiah. To the Jew were the initial promises of God and of the remnant that would remain under the coming of Messiah in that first century. To the Jew were the prophecies where they knew that the time was at hand, according to what Daniel and others had said. To the Jew was the investment of God in the great Abraham and his descendancy and all that God wanted for them, which was for them to be saved, he wanted it so bad. But he's not going to make it. They get first crack at it. He goes to the synagogue. Let's stop here, church, and think for just a moment. Why does the church suffer nowadays? Well, first of all, too many people are satisfied. I already mentioned that. But since they are satisfied, what do they not do? They don't engage their neighbors. They don't know what their neighbors are about. They don't know what religion their neighbors are. They don't know what religion anybody they encounter is. Even among those that may, maybe they pal around with in uh, hobbies or clubs or at work. They just don't know them. They don't know them because they would find it uncomfortable if they were to actually be around them when those people were doing their praying or doing whatever it is they do. Now, you're not supposed to loosen your own principles, give up on some things and say, well, I'll skip church because my buddy wanted me to go with him. I want to see what that's all about. I didn't say do that. There are other ways around that. But you've got to know and engage your friends and the people that you know. And there's more than one way to do that. I want you to stop and ask yourself for just a moment. Acts chapter 13, Acts 14, Acts 17. Those Jews by that time, are still participating in a religion that has been nailed to the cross. The law of Moses is gone. And they're still doing it, right? They don't need to be doing that anymore. Where does Paul go? Does he say, well, I'm above that now. I'm too good to be going in there with them Jews. Well, I used to be like that, but I'm not that way anymore. No, he came to a community. He said, where's the synagogue? And he went in there and he visited with them. Now, I believe there's a lesson in that for us. Furthermore, Paul went into the marketplace areas in order to find conversion and prospects. The Gentiles are not going to have a temple or synagogue worship like the Jews did. And in fact, many of the places that the Gentiles would resort to, Paul can't go there. He's not going to go into the middle of some kind of uh, big immoral seen uh, where they would have temple prostitutes and practice the various things that they did in the Gentile heathen temples. He's not going to do that. So how is he going to engage the Gentiles? He goes to the marketplace. You all know good and well, don't you, what the marketplace is. It means nowadays when you're at the grocery store, when you're at Walmart, when you're at the flea market, you know that as well as I do. There's interesting things that happen. I, I have really not taken advantage of this like I should because sometimes my thoughts have been so selfish. Now, I'm making confession to you all, and I hope you can appreciate that I'm not up here just to you know clear my soul because y'all wouldn't know what I did or didn't do. I'm just saying that I want you to realize if you've been the same way in your life, we can change. <laughs> I've been over at the grocery store before and, you know, somebody stopped and start talking to me and they start telling me all kinds of stuff. And it's like, man, you know, I'm here to get some milk and eggs and, you know, you want to make confession and I, you know, I need to be somewhere. And I do. That was the perfect place. That's where Paul went in order to get his contacts, wasn't it? That's where he's at for that very purpose. And here I'm acting like, no, 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 I got my bed. This isn't the time nor the place. Like I have to arrange some formal meeting or something. Yes, if you'll come meet me on Tuesday night at 6 p.m. over at the church office, I'll make sure that the suit is on and that, you know, you've had time to clean up and eat some supper and then we'll talk about this in a serious man-to-man -man kind of way. He's trying to talk to you because that's on his mind. 
He didn't care about the loaf of bread his wife sent him to get. That's not what worries him. What worries him is what he sees the preacher and is wondering about and what he's talking to you about. Maybe he won't even address it directly and it takes a little time and you've got to kind of pull him in because you see you know he's got something on his mind. I'm not saying just go hang out in Walmart, although a lot of people seem to do for weird reasons. But I'm just saying that if the opportunity arises, no matter where you are, take advantage of it. You know what happens with the church? We don't realize that there are many opportunities to be engaged in the public sector because we know that it is going to be something different that draws us out of our comfort zone. So over in Tompkinsville, they have regular times, fairly regular, in which they allow anybody to come and set up a booth. And in that booth, you can sell or give away pretty much anything on most occasions. On really big occasions, they might tell you, you can give away stuff, but you can't give them any water or something because we got you know, food vendors and stuff, and you just can't do that. But on, on most of them, yeah, you can just give the people anything. Do whatever you want. We have things like Bible drawings. Uh, tell the ladies, you know, we all make some various kinds of cookies and we'll bundle them up. You see what I mean? And then we just give it out. This next one coming up, of course, we're going to have all kinds of junk candy in it and we're going to decorate the booth up and everything. But you say, well, what do you accomplish by that? We are there to engage the people and to interact with them and to let them know. Here is somebody that if you're interested, yeah, just put your name right there. And uh, we will send you some Bible material. You get to keep it absolutely free. If you want to send it back, we'll grade it and get back with you like a Bible correspondence course here. Over here is some free literature if you're interested in that or something or if you know somebody in your family, just, just take it. It's all right. Well, over here's some pens. Got information about the church or something. You need a pen to write with. Maybe you want to take some notes about something you saw here or whatever. Take one. Take it with you. We have all kinds of stuff there about the church and for the church and we just present that before the people. Now somebody says, well, uh, if you do that, what do you hope to accomplish by it? Number one, we try to do all that we can in order to get definite contacts. Only those who have a religious inclination will actually interact with us, and therefore we immediately get a whole list right there in front of us. Number two, you have opportunity sometimes to present gospel truth that you would never have had opportunity before. Case in point, recently at one such event, there was right up from us. Now, it wasn't the very next one, but it was the one beside it. And there was a, uh, another religious organization that had set up a booth. Brethren, let me say this as kindly as I possibly can. I don't know how to say it in a politic way. I'm going to say it in a way that hopefully will make it to where you don't misunderstand it. The only people that have a right to evangelize are God's people. Anybody else that says, I've got this other religion out here and I want to push it. I want to be evangelistic about it. All right, look, you want me to leave you alone? I'll leave you alone. But if you think you have the right to push it, I've got the right to push back. Now, they had their own booth thing up there, and actually somebody came from that booth over to ours. And uh, they wanted to talk to me about the name of God and a variety of things that I didn't consider to be particularly significant. And so we're going, and, and of course we had Bibles out there, because like I said, we were giving away Bibles. And we had a drawing for, and boy, I was getting all kinds of good contacts, addresses, and everything. I think there's jokes. Anyway, because I was getting all these names and addresses and stuff, because we had these nice Bibles, and I said, look, give me your name and address. We will engrave the winner for you, and we'll get it back to you then. We'll bring it over to your home. So recently I went out with an elder, and we were bringing it back to their houses. Well, anyway, this person came over and wanted to talk to me about a few things. And it gave me an opportunity to present a thing or two from God's word in a nice way, just casual conversation, that probably that person would have never allowed me to present to them or never have been able to see that side of me if they were listening to me say preach from the pulpit, if they happened to ever show up, which I doubt they would. But they on that occasion were able to just kind of stand there while we happen to have a Bible on the table and I'm able to say, uh, yeah, but let's, let's look at this one over here. Isn't that interesting? And, it's, let's, and let's look at this one over here. 
Yes, that's a beautiful passage. I agree with that. Sometimes they want you to argue, and when you won't argue, that really gets them, you know, because they, why argue about stuff? Yes, that's great. Beautiful passage. I agree. And so anyway, uh, the thing about it is, is it gives you opportunity. You must engage people. The Apostle Paul engaged them. That's what gave him the opportunity to present the lesson that he gave on Mars Hill. That's what gave him the opportunity to get a lot of churches that were mixed, both Jew and Gentile in background, and caused the church to establish itself and grow in that area because he was teaching at the synagogues first. And if they didn't want to listen to it, or he had already converted all the Jews he could, then he would go to the marketplace. And then furthermore, if you go to that third reference, in Acts chapter 20, it was pointed out when he was talking to the Ephesian elders, you saw my manner of life. You saw how I was behaving. I went into the houses. Churches today say, yeah, we go to the houses. We have a door knocking campaign. My friend, you do that. That is great. Not enough churches do door knocking. That is great. I have no problem with it at all. The reason I say that is because I'm about to tell you something that's a negative on it. <laughs> I don't have any problem with it, though. Knock on those doors. Mass visitation is good, but it's a cold visit. Remember what I said Sunday afternoon for those who were with us? And if you weren't, it's easy to get you up to speed. The first and greatest commandment and the second like unto it. If they don't know already that you love them, that visit is not nearly as effective. They've got to know there's somebody that loves them that is talking to them, that is invested in their life, that is not just there in order to gin up business like a business would. No, we're interested in souls. I'm interested in actually being your friend. And if you're already that person's friend or at least acquainted with them, then when you affect that person for the gospel, when you get them to be touched by something that gets them thinking about Jesus, that is an effective visitation. Maybe more so than knocking on a hundred different doors. Yes, do mass visitations, that's fine. But I believe there is a more effective way. There's a middle section there in that uh, worksheet. <laughs> it talks about my failed attempts. I want to talk to you about those now for just a moment as we study on a few other scriptures. I said tonight was like the meat and potatoes of it. Well, you look back down into what the church has been doing down through the years, and I was looking at what I was trying to do. And then I looked at who I was preaching to. You all are so similar to Germany in a lot of ways. Y'all actually have uh, more young people here in the sense of very young ones. Um... You have uh, potential. Uh, I mean, the, the building's beautiful. You have plenty of classroom uh, space, from what I can tell. It's just, it's all ready. Uh, you have the proclamation of the gospel. You have leadership in place. Let, let's move on then to the next stage. What have we been doing that's holding us back? How can we make that better? I got to thinking, Tim, you have preached for rural churches all your life, all my life. And I kept on trying to present the gospel from those congregations in the same way that the gospel is presented to congregations of a community. The reason I'm about to stress what I'm about to do, the way I'm going to do it, is because I don't want you to forget it. There is no Trousdale. Even if you go in Tennessee to something called Trousdale County, it's not much of a county. And this is really not much of a place. Y'all are in the middle of nothing. You understand what I'm saying? Nothing. Germany is in the middle of what's called Heston, Kentucky. There is no Heston. Not anymore. It doesn't exist. Brother Long knows it doesn't exist. The last thing was when the old barbecue place burned down years ago. They had already lost the post office. There are no Hestons that live there anymore. They all died. It emptied out just like a lot of rural America. There is no Heston. We don't even know why it's called Germany Church of Christ. Nobody can tell me. I got there. Why are we Germany? So we can get more internet traffic? No, it was called that way before the internet. So what? why is it called Germany Church of Christ? Nobody knows because it's all gone. 
We're in the middle of nothing. People come to church from Germany, from two states, and from a variety of counties. You have to, or there would be nobody at church at Germany. And here I am thinking, well, I'm going to evangelize. What are you going to evangelize? This community. There is no community. Now, Trousdale's in a similar condition. And you got a lot of sister congregations that are closer to community than you all are, or at least centralized for community purposes. So what are you going to do? Well, I believe that you need to take an approach that I'm about to talk to you about because I believe it's based upon the Bible idea. The house-to-house concept is going to be most effective when it is personalized. And the house-to-house and marketplace concept is going to be most effective when it branches out from the congregation itself. Now, here's what I mean by that. In the church, you've got so many families. I don't want anybody to respond to this and tell me, but I want you to be honest with yourselves. When's the last time you looked at your own church directory? When is the last time your church directory was updated? When's the last time you made sure that you knew everybody that was there at church? Now be honest with yourself about answering those things. I want to evangelize and begin with those that I know and those that I love. You've got to have a knowledge to do that. You need to know your church contacts. You need to know your prospects. You preachers listening to me here, you need to know the other soil, those that are already part of the family of God, but maybe go somewhere else. Just leave them alone. You don't want to swell. You want to evangelize. Leave them alone. If they want to worship with you here at Trousdale, they're more than welcome, but you're not stealing anybody, right? You want to know those who are bad soil. You bring a preacher into the community, and I've seen this too because it's happened with me and it happens with, I guess, all of us. They say, well, I wish old Joe down the road, somebody could get through to him. He's a great guy. I just really wish he'd obey the gospel. And the fifth preacher in a row is sent down to talk to old Joe, whose heart is hardened from hearing thousands of sermons and already having had multitudes of gospel preachers, probably far more talented than any of us, try to convince him and talk to him about coming to the Lord. And all they can think about is, well, we just wish old Joe would get converted. I'm not saying give up on old Joe. I'm saying go find somebody else too. Go find somebody else. If old Joe wants to come to the gospel, you know he's been invited. You know he's got opportunity. Your heart is open to him and ready at any time, but you can't go to sleep at night worried about old Joe. You've got to go to sleep at night concerned about a new soul, somebody else. You love more than just old Joe. Therefore, don't waste the new preacher's time. Send him off to new places and new venues and opportunities. You want to spread the gospel. Well, we want everybody around us to be saved. We're not, uh, you know, we don't operate all over the world. We want them to be saved here. Yeah, but there is no here. So what do you do? You network out from those that you know. You've got your church contacts, and then who is it that is in your family? Who is it you live beside, and what kind of religious background do they have? Network out. And the benefit of that is, is that I can distinctly remember failing when I would look down and I would say, all right, I'm going to get modern with this. I've got Google Maps, and it'll show me satellite images of all the different places that are near the church building where I'm at. And I didn't do this with Germany because I was determined to do it from the networking standpoint. And we've had some success with that, but we're, we're still working on it. But anyway, I would totally fail when I would say, all right, now I want to make sure everybody in this block has been visited and everybody that's in with uh, you know, a quarter mile radius first and then I'll start branching out and everything. Don't you know those people already knew about whatever church I was at? They already understood about the church. And furthermore, there was only so many of those people. And it was once again the haphazard, knock on the door, cold visit. You don't know me. You don't know that I care about me. I'm obviously there to see you just because of where you live, not because of who you are or because I have a special connection to you. I should have been dealing with who I had there in the congregation and working out from that, not from looking at it from the community standpoint. (laughs) I've mentioned to you all at different times the various approaches you can use. A city church can use more of a community approach because first of all, they're liable to have more monetary resources. 
They can do things like get the whole house mailings, like the house to house and stuff, and then work out from that. I'm not saying that's not a valid procedure, just like door knocking. I'm saying that I'm convinced that the Bible method of the personal visitation and the visitation of those whoever are around you, not trying to go out and get those that aren't around you anyway, but whoever is naturally around you at public events and networked from the families, those who are related in the families, those who are neighbors of people who are in the church, these are the ones you naturally want to work with first. These are the ones you, you reach out to because that better prospect might live why close to 30 minutes from the church building, but his best friend or his family member is one of them that travels to worship with you all. And it's no big deal to them because we're in modern age, right? we got the vehicles. We can do it. And that person's a good prospect. What is it, preacher? You can't travel a half hour? Boy, I was put to shame. A while back, uh, Brother Jason Thompson from over at a nearby congregation was telling us some of our Latino brethren, you know, just like when you want to get a good job done quick, then a lot of times you, the best thing you need to do is just hire you on about five or ten Mexicans and just tell them to go at it. Just go at it. We couldn't get a new porch put on the Germany church building to save our lives. Two years we worked on that. Finally, we found this Latino fella. He had it up in two days. <laughs> just <laughs> boom. He just did it. When we found him, he said, yeah, I'll do it. The other people said, no, I'll get to it one of these days. Well, I'm swamped. I don't know if I can get to that or something. He said, yeah, I'll do it. And he just did it. Did a great job. But they just worked like dogs. Now, the reason I tell you that is because that is also the case somewhat in the church. They started the Iglesia de Cristo over at the Rock Valley Congregation, which is near Germany. And they're very close to us. And I was somebody who was involved in the beginning of that uh, congregation, of the Latino congregation, and went to the, some of the Bible studies that got it going with the help of a uh, Spanish-speaking preacher that was coming up from Putnam County that was supported by the Jefferson Avenue Congregation. That was Brother Bo Perez. You might know him, Brother Gann, from over there in the area. But anyway... Uh, he's since gone back to Nicaragua so that he can try to evangelize his own people. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that, that's, that's really nice that he would be thinking about them so much. Before my health goes, i got to go back to my people and my family. i got to teach them the gospel. Wow, that's powerful. Give up America to go down there? He wanted to do it. Anyway, uh, this guy was telling me that was, uh, Brother Jason was relaying the information to me, Brother Thompson was, he said this guy in the Latino church was talking to them. He was all excited. Well, what are you excited about? There's a fella, and this guy was from over further in East Tennessee, the Latino man was. There's this guy up around, I think it was Bristol or something. And boy, he's interested in a Bible study. He wants to hear the gospel. Isn't it amazing? I get another Bible study lined up. The man only lives two hours away. Two hours away? You're going to go for a weekly Bible study? Go visit that man lives two hours long? Yeah. Isn't that great, brother? You know, it's a, we're working on him. This could be it. You know, we, uh, he seems like a really good prospect. That was nothing to them. The idea was is where's the soul? Where is the person who needs the gospel? Let's take the gospel to them. We got to have some of that. We got to have some of that spirit. If we don't have that, we're never going to make it in America, brethren. God's grace will go somewhere else like India or Nigeria or something. They'll export the gospel and the whole nation will go down, down, down. You think it's bad now? It's nothing when God takes the grace away from you as a people. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Righteousness exalts a nation. If we are not the salt of the earth and if we don't give them enough light, then it has impacts unto our whole nation and it will have impacts upon our children and our grandchildren and we don't want that, do we? We're fighting for the survival of our people. We love them. We want to see them become Christian. Community evangelism has been tried, and in the rule setting, I'm convinced that it fails. Family and friend connections, networking evangelism is definitely the way to go. Many times, we have brethren who have the very best of intentions. They are trying many different methods in order to grow the church and to edify the body of Christ, but they don't work it. Now, when I say don't work it, I, I'm not being fussy like I was last night. And I was just generally fussy then when I said you can't even have the gumption to change your church sign, that kind of thing. Tonight, what I mean is, is that they don't follow up like a business would follow up. 
If you would do it in the world, why can't you do it in the church? So a church has vacation Bible school, okay? You can draw in people and young people in families like you would never get for a gospel meeting in a vacation Bible school. It doesn't mean that VBSs are inherently more evangelistic or that the time of gospel meeting has just come and gone. If y'all believed that, you wouldn't be here tonight. What it does mean is that it's a prime opportunity because the people don't see a VBS as something that is sectarian in nature. You can, it is so easy, isn't it? Isn't it just like, uh, just as natural as a smile on a baby's face for you to just tell your neighbor, say, hey, we're, we're going over to VBS tonight. Your kids, you know, they had a loose end. We'd love to have them hop in the car. You know, they just go with us to VBS. They might tell you no to any number of religious activities here at Trousdale. If it's a VBS, they'll say, hey, y'all want to go? Yeah, they say they're all for it. All right, man, hop in the car, kids. It, uh, when you have them back, I'll have them back about 8, 30 or so. All right, yeah, all right, we'll see you later. Hope you have fun. They get over there and you teach them Bible. We have all these churches having these incredible VBSs. I go to them and they're all good. I mean, the VBS is fun, isn't it? And the intensity of the Bible instruction. Children learning Bible songs just like that and learning a Bible verse and memorizing it just like that because it was done in an atmosphere they don't even know they're learning. You know what I mean? And they just got it. VBS, oh yes. But what happens at the end of VBS? Everybody sits back in the church and say, wow, boy, that was a big VBS. That's because you measured it by the number of heads. You didn't measure it by what you actually were wanting to get out of that. And that is a soul that comes to the Lord maybe later on down the road. What should you have been doing? I ran across, well, ain't nobody else here from, don't you tell them none, Germany over about this. <laughs> I got a little, a little feedback. The, the teachers were a little uncomfortable with it. They had a lot to do in their classes at VBS. And last year in our VBS, I had pressed them. I said, look, you've got to get me in your class. I need those names. I know you got little ones and it's hard to get the information out. Please, I need the names. I need where they live, okay? I, who's mommy and daddy, you know, are y'all? So what, what, what's the deal? What, where's my connection? Give me a phone number. Give me an address. Give me something. I want a roster in your classes. I want y'all to work that. Well, I got word back from uh, one of the male members that, and them teachers say, that's, that's rough on them because, you know, they come in there and they have a definite amount of time. They have this huge lesson to give. And you got different kids each night, and it's really hard to juggle that in addition to all that we were telling them to do. Well, I started to go easy on them this past year, this I mean this year, the last vacation Bible school, but in the end I decided, no, we're not going to go that route. I'm not going to let this VBS go and me not know all these different little young'uns that showed up and not have them for my prospect file. I gave it to them anyway. I don't care if they're a little put out with the preacher telling them here's one other thing you got to do that's too bad i'm here to evangelize those little souls maybe someday in the future you ought to be in for that too give me that name i don't care if you have to sit him down in the corner and have, give him a crayon and have him spell out something you can't understand he's saying or something give me the name give me the address who's his mommy and daddy i want inquiry minds want to know these things we got to know them if you're going to follow up you got to work it. If you're going to have the VBS, woo, we're wore out. We had a big VBS. The work has just begun because that gave you the opportunity now to have an influence and to reach out to them. Those little children went back into that home with that mom and dad who said, y'all want to go to VBS? Ah, sure, hop in with them. That's fine. You go now back into their home and they have a connection to you. Now, we, we treated them just as good as we could. And uh, your children did so good during vacation Bible school time. Did you know that we would love to be able to instruct them every Sunday? Can, can you not let us maybe let them give that a try? And so next thing you know, maybe they let the children come at regular church Sunday school. Next thing you know, those children are so worked up, you couldn't get anywhere with them. But <laughs> they were talking to mommy and daddy and they said, come with us, come with us. Aha! Uh -huh. See, you didn't have to say a word, did you? Here they come. Folks, networking evangelism. 
Work it. The follow-up. It's so important. There are some who are ever learning and never come to a knowledge of the truth. How can we ever get them to the point of conversion if you're always just, well, teach them, teach them, teach them? No, you actually got to finally get them to the point where they're in a Bible study, they consider the invitation of the gospel, and they obey it. You have to actually draw things down to the point of impact. I've got to actually get serious with somebody and get them to talk to me about the gospel. It's not enough just to hold an event for them. I've got to follow up and work it. I've already mentioned to you about various things that can be done in the nature of working in a community and making sure that you understand that when you do that, there are going to be people who disagree with you. Um, this will come naturally in, in various ways. I'm not sure here how the church encourages and, and supports the various things that Brother Northcutt has uh, planned in his evangelistic work. I know that one of the things that uh, the churches are interested in around the state line is radio work. Uh, I'll never forget the time I was at the radio station because sometimes I like to do it live. I've had a program in the past called Talk Back Tuesday, and they can call in with live questions, you know, and I answer them uh, on the air and stuff. I, I'll never forget one time I, I was there at the radio station, and this guy shows up at the radio station, and uh, he, just, he just walks inside of it in the lobby there when I'm done with the program, and he looks at me, and he lets me know that, you know, yeah, he, he hears my program. That's nice. It's nice to meet you, sir. And uh, he said, sometimes some of the things you say make me so mad. Well, I sized him up and I said, well, let's go talk about it outside. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, did, I, I, did, I did want to want to take it away from the, you know, the radio business there, you know. I, but I, I wasn't sizing him up. I just <laughs> said, no, let's just go talk about it. Well, sure enough, he calmed down so quick because, you know, I was just matter of fact about things and easy going and, and he became very easy going himself and stuff. He just wanted to let me know, I guess, get it off his chest that, you know, when I said some things that, that really rubbed a, a nerve, it rubbed him raw. And the thing about it is, is that the apostle said there in first Corinthians, in that passage in first Corinthians 16, nine, there's a great and effectual door open to me at Ephesus, but there are many adversaries. Many adversaries. If you present the gospel to people that some uh, have not heard before, well, they're just not going to like it. And you're not going to make them like it because it goes against their manner of life. It goes against something from their family background. And for whatever case, they're going to shut themselves off to it. They're not going to like it. As long as you're prepared in courage as a Christian, then you can deal with that because that means the word is getting out there. It's actually a good sign. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. Because so they did unto the false prophets of old. Isn't that what Jesus said? I know that's what he said. And therefore we ought not to think everybody is going to say, Oh, well, Trousdale Church, great church. Germany Church, great church. No, some people are not going to like you when you push the gospel. But push it must be. There are all kinds of things that you can try in the end, you finally have to talk to somebody about the Bible. Somebody in the church says, Preacher, I could never do that kind of thing. Yes, you most definitely can. You don't have to know how to make a presentation. You don't have to do, really, much, know how to do hardly anything. There are some of the simplest, most straightforward little Bible lessons that you can give somebody. Just tell them, say, hey, can you sit down with me and us fill in these blanks? You take one and I'll take one. You take one and I'll take one and go right down through it. There's a little three booklet uh, Bates Bible study that is put out and it's fabulous. There is a more expansive open Bible study or the Fishers of Men Bible studies. It'll take them through 10 or 12 lessons if you want to get fancy with it. There is still the old fashioned Jewel Miller uh, you know, DVDs that you can use on them if there's somebody that's an older person and don't mind the little hinky graphics in it and stuff. But we've had recent converts off of that. Showed them to uh, two different ladies, converted both of them because they could see, yeah, that's, that's the truth, all right. And it was easy. You sat down, you pushed in the little disc, and we watched a movie together. You say, well, I don't know how to evangelize somebody. When they get interested in baptism, you sick Brother Allen on them, he'll take care of the rest, okay? But in the meantime, show them the video, give them the little thing, say, let's fill out the cards together. Any method will work. As long as you're going through that Bible, my friend, 
get them into that Bible. It's not that people don't want to study the Bible. They're scared. They're scared it's going to change them, and it will. They have a right to be scared if that's all they're afraid of is change. But some change is for the better. And once they can see how much better, then they need to become a Christian, and hopefully many of them will. Well, there's many other things we could touch on along this line. But I want you to understand that this was such a powerful theme of people like the Apostle Paul that in his life, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, down in verse 22, I have become all things to all men that I by all means might save some. I want to save somebody. You, you want to act like a Gentile? You want me to be in that culture? Fine. What is your culture like? I'll talk like you talk. I'll dress like you dress. I'll get to know you and however y'all structure things and all that. All I want you to do is be ready for the judgment of God. You're somebody who is, uh, uh, you know, out here and you're from a different generation or me or something. Uh, fine, I'll get down on the floor and play with your kids, you know. I'll let you know that I'm, I'm not somebody that's, uh, you know, separate from, from you. Maybe by, you know, a few years in life, uh, at one point he even said Paul the aged, right? But you can imagine him looking out at a young family or something and saying, hey, yeah, you, uh, all right, let's go over to the arena to the ball game or something. While we're there, I want to talk to you. Okay, okay, pops, let's go. You know, he said anything he could do, anything he could do. Because he didn't know but that that soul would have no other opportunity to obey the gospel. Maybe that was his shot. Today was their day of salvation, and he wanted to get to them by any means necessary. We have something that the Apostle Paul didn't have. When he was writing to the Thessalonian brethren, he told them, he said, uh, I don't want you to think that the time of Christ is at hand in the sense of right now. First, there must be the falling away first and so forth. Remember he taught the Thessalonian brethren about that? See, God had revealed that to him. He didn't know when Jesus would return, but he knew that certain things prophesied had to occur first. For example, Jerusalem hadn't been totally destroyed and Jesus had given that prophecy, right? So certain things are going to have to happen so you all are waiting around and say, oh, the Lord's going to come back any minute. We want you to be ready for God, he says, but it's not happening right now because it, it's always at hand. It's nearby. God can have judgment come to you personally, but the second coming, no, 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 it's not right now, he said. My friends, I can't tell you that nowadays. I can't tell you that. You can go out those doors and start going home tonight, and we may not make it. It's that uncertain. There is no other promise that we're waiting on. Do you all know that? There is nothing that hinders the commitments that God has made in his word. There is nothing that holds back from the standpoint of God say, uh, you know, saying, well, so-and-so has got to be born in history before so-and-so occurs. We are totally at his will. And if he says... Tonight is the night. Then Jesus is coming. I can't tell you you have time to do any of these things. What I can tell you is this. Right now, today, is your day of salvation. What if tomorrow is too late? Right now is an opportunity for you to commit yourself and say, I want to work in God's family and I want the Lord to help me in this and I want you all to pray for me to be stronger as an influence on others and stronger as a Christian so that I can make it. If you've thought about making that confession, then the Lord's waiting on you because he doesn't tell you you're going to get a chance to make that confession tomorrow. He didn't give you a, uh, an opportunity maybe to put into some big grand plan that's going to work five down the, years down the road for converting that loved one, but you can make sure your soul is ready tonight. And that's what we want to make sure in this gospel meeting is that everybody knows every night before you leave those doors, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. God will receive you. He loves you and has shown you that through Jesus Christ. If you'll come to him and promise to work for him, it's a lifetime of beautiful service. 
of a challenge that opens up unto you such a world of love and friendship that you will never regret coming to the Lord. And then in the end, eternal life. Everything is to be gained. But only if you say yes to Jesus, if you come to him as we stand and sing. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. There is danger and death in delay. Except God save. Children here are the most patient children I've ever seen. I've been really long-winded this meeting, and they have done just absolutely wonderfully. I mean, uh, I'm either preaching them asleep, or they're just that well-behaved. They're just, they're, and, and it could be a combination. Secondly, tomorrow night is the Beatitudes. We're switching gears entirely. Tomorrow night is not really lessons dealing with you know church edification and like that. I mean, all that's related, of course, but it is really focused on that section of the Sermon on the Mount want you all to think about us arising to the blessed state, finish on a different note, and hopefully a high note, uh, tomorrow evening. I we'll encourage you to come out and see us then. I'll say as far as the kids go with long-windedness, they're used to that. So. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well trained. Now, in all seriousness, you know, a lot of times I like to get up here and, and uh, make a joke have fun, have a good time, and, and things like that. After a sermon like that, there's no need in doing that. You know, it, it doesn't matter whether you're a preacher, elder, deacon, regular member, however you wanted to look at it. I think that that lesson right there all encouraged us and challenged us to do better on our evangelistic efforts and how we can uh, accomplish and win our goals. Tremendous lesson. I know I've said that every night, but that one really took the cake. Thank you. Uh, it's been a privilege to be able to worship with you here this evening. We have one more chance, one more opportunity. Uh, I know that many of you have your own congregations to go to, and that's fine. Uh, again, I will reiterate that uh, the, the lessons are all on uh, Facebook and YouTube. So after you get to, to church, if you want to on Thursday night, go back, look it up on YouTube, on Facebook, and uh, pick up the lesson that you missed. Uh, because he's done a fantastic job. We're looking forward to a, a humdinger finish. There you go. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, other than that, God bless you. We hope to see you back again tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Brother Tim Long is going to dismiss us after a song led by Brother Matt. Okay, let's turn to number 6. We'll do the first and last of number 6. Anywhere with Jesus. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere so extremely grateful to have been granted the opportunity to be here this evening. We're so very thankful for this congregation and for what they represent for all of God's people gathered here together this evening. We're thankful for Brother McHenry and for his evangelistic spirit. We're thankful for the wonderful lesson he's presented this evening. We pray that we would be able to take it and to apply it to our own endeavors. Be with us, Heavenly Father. Grant us a safe journey home. Help us to have the wisdom to continue to live for thee and to look forward to a home in heaven someday. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.